Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a serial entrepreneur who has sold a couple of startups to some big names in the tech world. He is the co-founder of Pilot, a financial accounting and tax services for startups and growing businesses, Wasim Dahir. As I began browsing Pilot's website, I came across a resource page and stumbled upon the burn rate calculator. Calculate your burn rate and startup runway, which got me thinking. What is a burn rate calculator? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Now, let me start out by saying this information can be found on Pilot's website, including 20% off to the Shades of Entrepreneurship listeners if you have subscribed to the newsletter. The burn rate is the pace at which a new company is running through its startup capital ahead of it generating any positive cash flow. The burn rate is typically calculated in terms of the amount of cash the company is spending per month, according to Investopedia. In short, burn rate is actually the amount of cash in an entrepreneur's account has decreased in one month per pilot. According to Pilot, most of the time, it describes a company's negative cash flow. It doesn't include outstanding obligations, money that is transferred into another account, or money that's on its way. It is truly a snapshot of a specific time for a specific time frame. Here is an example of burn rate. Let's say a company has a million dollars cash in the bank and is spending $100,000 a month. Take a million dollars divided by 100,000 equals 10 months left of cash until the company is out of cash in that bank account. Again, not taking into account outstanding balances, other accounts, money on the way, only cash in the bank. There are burn rate calculators online. Now, Pilot highlights two different burn rates, net burn rate and gross burn rate. Gross burn rate is the amount of cash that an entrepreneur spent in a single month. It does not take total revenue, incoming cash, into account. Net burn rate takes incoming revenue from cash into account. So net burn rate is an entrepreneur's cash lost in a single month. To keep things simple, Pilot refers to net burn rate and gross burn rate as burn rate. Visit Pilot for more information about the burn rate calculator. But why is any of this important? If an entrepreneur burns their cash too quickly, the entrepreneur runs the risk of running out of funds to keep the business going. Business failure rate in the U.S. within the first year is about 20%, 18.4% to be exact, according to LendingTree BLS data. And one of the biggest reasons entrepreneurs fail is because of cash flow. According to the CB Insights, 30% of failed startups point to running out of cash and not being able to raise new capital as the central issue. Furthermore, according to a May 2021 LendingTree survey, 40% of surveyors said not having enough money was what's keeping prospective entrepreneurs from starting their own business. A burn rate calculator can be used by any entrepreneur at any stage in their career. As Pilot states, the burn rate calculator can be used to calculate a runway. An example given is the number of months the entrepreneur has left before the entrepreneur runs out of cash. Since the burn rate reflects the net cash that is left in the entrepreneur's account in the month, the entrepreneur can use the trend to extrapolate, which means to estimate or conclude, and see how many months it would take before the entrepreneur burns through the cash balance. This is also true for personal finance. Use the burn rate calculator to determine an entrepreneur's personal rainy day fund. A rainy day fund is a small amount of money for unexpected expenses. There are mainly two options to reduce burn rate, increase revenue or cut costs. Example given, marketing, vendor relationships, office space, staffing. Increase revenue by focusing on core competencies. Pursuing every idea is a quick way to divert from those core competencies Unfortunately, we are seeing cost-cutting measures being taken place on local and national levels, including reduction of staff, and that is why the entrepreneur should care. The burn rate calculator is a financial tool. It is intended to paint a picture of the entrepreneur's financial state. Life comes at us fast. Understanding our current financial state is important in case the unthinkable happens. Like the good old G.I. Joe's cartoon said, knowing is half the battle. And if the entrepreneur needs some help, hire a pilot. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My 
my next guest has successfully sold two startups of Dropbox and Oracle. With a degree in computer science from MIT, he is the co-founder and CEO of the finance, accounting, and tax service startup, Pilot. Please welcome Wasim Dahir. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Wasim Daher. Did I get that correctly? Yeah, Daher. Yeah, here. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me. How uh, are you now, doing? You're the founder of Pilot. So we're going we're gonna to talk about Pilot here a little bit. But first, I want to introduce the world to Wasim. Really, really cool name. Please give them a little background, family, education. Where, where are you calling in from? Sure. Well, I'm calling in from San Francisco, but it sounds like we should just take it from the tippy top, huh? Yeah, let's do it. So let's see. Well, my parents were born and raised in Lebanon. They and their siblings all moved to the U.S. in the 70s and 80s, mostly actually Northeast Ohio. And then in sort of classic immigrant fashion, many of my relatives worked at it until they became small business owners of one kind or another, whether it was a bar, a restaurant, gas station, small medical practice, that kind of thing. Uh, I mostly grew up in the D.C. area, but my parents worked for the government. And the way I guess I got started on my entrepreneurial journey, well, one is, of course, being inspired by sort of what I saw with my own relatives and their kind of small business ownership. But it all, I think the big turning point for me was I went to undergrad at MIT where I had studied computer science and that's where I met my co-founders, Jeff and Jessica. And so we were in classes together. We were in the computer club together and we've actually done now three companies together. The first one was acquired by Oracle. The second one was acquired by Dropbox. And the third one is this current one, pilot, pilot pilot.com, which is a, now a tech unicorn and we're chugging away at it. I love it. That's, that's incredible. So have you, have you gone back to visit the, your parents' homeland? Have you been, have you been? Not, not really like once or twice, not a ton. Nice. So let's, let's talk about pilot. What, where, what is it and what are you, what are you hoping to do with it? What's the goal? Sure. So first of all, what is it? Pilot, Pilot pilot.com. Pilot provides finance, accounting, and tax prep services for startups and growing businesses. And what does that mean? Well, we run the financial back office today for thousands of businesses of all sizes and stages across a variety of industries. And what we're trying to do is really trying to be partners in helping our customers build enduring successful businesses. When you work with Pilot, you're paired with your dedicated team of experts on our side who are really focused on helping the business succeed. And that, that's ultimately the ambition, which is the reason that we started this company. It was This was a pain we had in our own previous companies. And we're like, well, let's just build the service we wish we could have bought when we were running our previous companies. So that is that kind of where the uh, idea of can kind of get into the finance world was, was like, hey, we kind of dealt with this ourselves. Exactly. And, you know, I think the thing that's interesting about this is anyone who starts a business of any kind, whether it's whether it's a tech company or whether it's a coffee shop or a florist, literally whatever it is, there's a reason you do it. And the reason you do it is because there's some product or service you want to bring into the world. And I think what people don't realize or what people underestimate is like, yes, you're doing your company. Of course, you're spending time on that but there's a huge chunk of your time that goes into back office stuff. And the back office stuff is like, it's actually really, really, really important to get right. And it's usually not the area of expertise of the business owner. And even if it is, it's generally not the highest leverage thing they could be doing. So what we said is, well, listen, we want to come in and we want to be the trusted partner, the expert that takes this stuff off our client's plates. And today, that's, that's principally the kind of accounting tax prep Eventually, though, I'd like to be doing everything, all of the kind of like admin back office stuff that stands between you and just letting you focus entirely on making the business successful. So so now let's take a step back because you mentioned that the reason you started this new business is because your former businesses that you recently sold off to other larger companies, you kind of saw this as an issue. Let's talk about those other companies. What were those other companies? And, And talk to the audience about like, how did you scale it? to the point you eventually were able to sell it. Sure. So the first company is a company called K-Splice. We had some technology that was actually based on my co-founder's master thesis at MIT. We had technology that could take software updates 
and install them while the system was running. I'm sure you've seen this on your laptop or your phone. You get the notification, hey, oh, yes. you know, we need to restart to install these updates. I love this guy already because this is so, exactly. it's such exactly. a nice feature. And, and this is a huge pain for server systems. Like, yes, it's inconvenient on your laptop or your phone, but it's actually a big problem for servers that host your website or credit card processing or email or whatever. So we had technology that could transform these updates and they could be installed without rebooting. And we sold that as a subscription to IT administrators who administered these kind of large server farms. And we totally bootstrapped the business. We got started with like a government grant and a little bit of winnings from winning a business plan competition. And we just kind of like slowly but surely one foot in front of the other, like got more customers, used that money to invest in growing the business until you know, we we grew it to seven figures in revenue. The team was probably about 15-ish people. And then Oracle came along and said, hey, listen, this capability you have is highly valuable for our customers. We'd like to make it part of our offering. We'd like to buy the company. And so that's really what happened with the first company. And then we were at Oracle, the transition over the tech, left, kind of got the band back together. We said we knew we wanted to do another company. And our second company was called Zulip. This was this was 2012 at the time. It was a group chat tool for businesses. So it was kind of like a Slack-like product at a time when Slack was, well, Slack didn't really exist. I think Slack was still making a mobile game at that point in time. And we sort of had a strong and opinionated hypothesis that, listen, chat at work could be different and more productive than it, than it is now, where the status quo in 2011, 2012 was pretty poor. And we actually, we did that company for about two years and then Dropbox acquired it. Dropbox, I think, was both interested in getting the team and had designs on, we'd like to do something kind of in the collaboration space on top of file sharing. Now, when you say, when when these organizations acquire a company, do do you, the, the, the team, right, the three co-founders, do you as co-founders also kind of go and become Dropbox employees and kind of help integrate it so for for some certain amount of time? Yeah, so I was at Oracle for a year, for example, and I was at Dropbox for uh, for two years as were my co-founders. Okay. And then so are you guys having conversations still at this time? You're at Dropbox, you're having conversations, and you're like, you know what? Remember that other issue we were dealing with? Could we help? Could we resolve that with a new company? Yeah, I think the feeling... and. I had a great time at Dropbox. A lot of love and respect for the team there. I think we learned a lot. I think we did a lot. But I susp- I felt like we kind of knew in the back of our minds, like, we're going to get the band back together again. Like, this was not our final company. Like, we're going to do it again. And actually, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. We spent almost no time thinking about it at Dropbox. While we were at Dropbox, we were honestly laser You're focused there. with yeah. how do we make our time at Dropbox successful, how do we make the company successful? Right. There comes a sort of natural point where you're like, all right, I'm ready to go do my own thing. And what's interesting about this actually is I'm a big believer in team before idea, which is I knew I wanted to work with this founding team again. And that was more important to me than what the idea was. So the first thing we did is we all got together and said, okay, let's do another company together. What is it? Like, what is it going to be? And it wasn't necessarily going to be where we landed. We just knew that this is the team that we want to do it with. Okay, what spaces can we get excited about? Now let's talk about scaling a little bit. How do you how do you 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 got the idea? You know, maybe we can take a look back at that first company where you got the idea, you scaled it, and how do you like market and brand it to the point where a team like Oracle actually takes notice of a small company like yours? Yeah, you know, it's it, it's interesting because I don't think that there's necessarily a secret there, which is I think the thing that got Oracle to take notice is that customers took notice and the customers liked it and they told their, uh, maybe let's say their friends, but really people in their same industry. And it was sort of a capability that really solved the problem that they had. And, you know, people ask me a lot, how do I build my company to be acquired or how do I get acquisition conversations to happen? And the unfortunate or even how do I raise money the kind of unfortunate reality of it especially in acquisitions is the best way to build a thing that will get acquired in some ways is build a strong business and if you've built a strong business actually you probably don't necessarily want to sell it so there's the secret to to having success on fundraising or acquisitions in some ways is actually just make the business successful there's no kind of shortcut or cheat code for it And for us, it meant being laser focused on 
Do we know who our customers are? Do we viscerally understand them? And are we solving a problem that is a big problem for them? And I think if you have all those elements, the business will be successful. You know, that's something I think we talk about often on this podcast is the importance of solving a problem. How, how you know, you mentioned um, you originally, the pilot in particular, this, this currently organization right now, where uh-huh. you got the idea looking at your old business. What are other ways entrepreneurs can think about, you know, because they, they want to have their business be successful as well. What is the secret to business success? Like how, how do how do they make their business successful? What are some thoughts that you might have on that? Yeah, I think you just have to solve a hair on fire problem for someone. And so there, there are two ways to go about doing that. One is if there's a problem that you have that is a hair on fire problem for you and, important and, and there are lots of people like you in the world, well, that's actually, that's also kind of a shortcut because you can build for yourself knowing that you are representative of a larger population. And so you'll, you'll show up working on the thing with strong conviction that you're solving a hair on fire problem for someone. The other option is getting really precise about who it is you think you're serving and really having conversation with them about, hey, listen, talk to me about your top three problems and confirming that the thing you're doing is in fact on that list. I, I think the biggest danger that folks have is they think they're solving a problem for someone, but it's actually not a problem that anyone really has. Or if it is a problem that they have, it's priority number 100, and they're never going to get to it. They're not willing to spend time on it. They're not willing to spend dollars on it. So you really have to be disciplined about confirming that you are solving a problem that is really a top three problem for someone. You know, it's funny. uh, One of these episodes recently talked about um, uh, brand guidelines and and talked about customer personas, right? And building a customer persona. What are some questions you could ask to help build? You know, what questions did your team actually ask to help build your customer persona? So we did a bunch of work surveying both our customers and the people who show up at our website who are not yet customers to try to segment to say, okay, what industries are they coming from? What stage of companies are they coming from? What roles do they have? Why did they reach out? Like, what is the pain point? And as you have lots and lots of these conversations, you start to hear themes. And then you can kind of group by theme. Oh, the reason I'm buying Pilot is because I, you know, need help forecasting. Or maybe the reason I'm buying Pilot is I know I need to deal with tax deadlines. Or maybe the reason I'm buying Pilot is I had a previous accountant and I didn't like them or they made a bunch of mistakes or whatever. And over time, you start to hone and refine these personas and you understand, okay, well, you're an example of persona X, Y, Z. These are the problems you have. And therefore, this is what we need to do to make working with Pilot really successful for you. What, what motivates you to keep going? I mean, honestly, working with an amazing team. I mean, kind of as I, as I said, before we started this startup, we were at Dropbox together. And I thought a lot about, well, do we want to do another company together? If so, why? Like, what am I personally trying to get out of it? And I think, you know, two things kind of rose to the top of the list. The first was a, a desire to work with smart, talented people. I think above all, I like I want to work with smart, talented people who push me to do my best work every day. And I think that for me is far and away the most important requirement. Like I, I think what people don't appreciate is that your day-to-day happiness is actually much, much more informed by the people you work with than even the company mission. And I'm not saying the company mission is not important. Of course it's important. But if you're working on the world's most inspiring mission, but your coworkers aren't great, I guarantee that you'll be miserable. So number one thing that motivates me is like the desire to work with smart, talented people. Number two is there's this kind of energy that comes from making something that people want. Like when I tell people about what we're up to, I want them to say like, wow, that sounds awesome. I really need that. And there's a joy in making something that really solves a problem for someone and in seeing their excitement about what you've built. It's a really, really satisfying feeling and it lets you take pride in your work. And I think that feeling is a really, really critical part of keeping you motivated. And so honestly, I guess to answer your question in brief, I think what keeps me motivated is is essentially like the love of the game. It's the energy I get from working with amazing people, chipping away at a hard problem that real people have. Now, as an entrepreneur, what are some things that keep you up at night? What are, what are you thinking about? 
I mean, honestly, just consistently providing a high quality experience as we scale. Like I think for any business, regardless of what the business is, it, it, generally it's easy to do a good job for one customer and it's harder to do a, job, a good job for 10 customers or 100 customers or 1,000 customers and so on and so forth. And so as we grow, which growing is a good thing, of course, the game gets harder and the stakes get higher. And, and interestingly, I think the bar is not just don't do a bad job. The bar is actually, well, listen, the experience for customer 10,000 should be better than the experience for customer one because we've learned a ton and we've built a ton. The company is much bigger. We have more resources. We've written all this software. Like that's kind of the standard we should be holding ourselves to. Now let's let's get a little, a little technical. What are some common mistakes, you know, common bookkeeping mistakes entrepreneurs are going to make that the pilot can help them with? Yeah, sure. And I think these are good things to take to heart whether you work with pilot or not. And there are probably five that I highlight. The first is don't mix your company's money with your own money. You definitely, definitely need and want to keep these pools separate for, for two reasons. One is the IRS gets very unhappy when you don't. And that's a good reason in and of <laughs> yes, itself. They do. But even if they didn't, you need to know what the health of the business is. And if you can't separate the business's expenses and revenues from your own, you're not going to be able to do that. So definitely, definitely, that's called commingling. Do not commingle. Do not mix your do company's not money with the business's, like with your company's money with your own money. So like, get the company a bank account, get the company a debit card or a credit card and just like keep those expenses separate. That's number one. Um, number two, as I'd say, is always use a payroll system to pay your employees. Payroll is complicated. There are lots of kind of laws and regulations around it. And again, the government gets very unhappy when you don't do it correctly. And it's tempting to be like, oh, surely I can just like write this person a check and it'll be fine. It's like, no, if you have employees there's payroll tax, there's all kinds of filings that have to have, and there's lots of rules. So just always, always use a payroll system to pay employees. I promise it is worth it. They're not that expensive in the grand scheme of things, and you'll save yourself a bunch of pain. Um, number three is even if the business made no money, the business has to file a corporate tax return every year. So just because it wasn't profitable doesn't mean that you're off the hook on the tax return. So make sure you understand kind of what the tax obligation is and that you're following up on it. And, and the fourth is really make sure someone's paying attention to the books. Like you need to know how, what the health of the business is, which requires you to know what you're making, what you're spending, how much cash you have available, et cetera. And the fifth is, again, kind of the reason we started this company in the first place, and this is a little bit, of course, I'm biased, but I think it's good advice. I think it's probably a costly mistake to be doing the bookkeeping yourself. Like you should hire a pilot, you should hire someone so that you, the business owner, you're still gonna engage with the work product but that doesn't require you to do it yourself. And it means that you can focus your time on making your business more successful. Because the reality of it is like, if you spend all of your time producing like really perfect high quality bookkeeping, well, good, you have good insights into the business, but that's not gonna like make your customers happier with your service. Like you need to be laser focused on the things that will actually help you deliver value for customers if you can partner with experts to take care of the stuff that is important, but it's like, it's not where you should be spending your time. You know, two, two of those five, it seems like, you know, we're really focusing on like the finance piece, making sure you're, you're in the know. So let's, let's give the listeners a little bit. Of, let's drop some knowledge on them a little bit. Let's talk about what is the burn rate and how does one calculate the burn rate? Cause I think this is being very important for these entrepreneurs to understand. Sure. So the burn rate is really, it's a concept probably mostly for startups that have raised money of some kind, but it's a use, useful concept in general. The burn rate is essentially how much money are you spending in a given month minus how much money are you bringing in in a given month? In other words, like net of all of your activity, how much money has left the company's bank account? Now, if the company is unprofitable, you have some burn rate. If the company is profitable, your burn rate is negative. Like you're actually making a little bit of money in a given month. And the reason it's so critical to get a handle on your burn rate is let's say you have a certain amount of cash in the bank and you have a certain burn rate. You do some math, you just divide those numbers and you can see, you can determine what's called your runway, which is, well, listen, if I keep spending at this rate, I'm going to be totally out of money in three months or five months, or six months, or a year, or two years, or whatever the number is. And the reason you need like such a good handle on that is because ultimately, ultimately, there are only two ways that your business can fail. Way number one is you run out of money. 
And way number two is that you give up. And the if you don't know what your burn rate and your runway are, you might accidentally run out of money without knowing it. So burn rate is like it's a very simplistic metric, but it is a helpful one because it basically tells you, listen, how much money are we spending each month? And what does that imply about how long I can continue to do this without taking some other kind of action? Yeah, I just I just want to repeat what you said because I think that was so powerful. Your business is only going to fail because of two reasons. You run out of money or you give up. And I think that is so true because I think a lot of the times it tends to be the latter of the giving up part <laughs> where, sure. where we, and, and it's easy to kind of do it because I think to your point, the difficulty of the accounting piece, you know, now what, who is your typical client? Who, who does pilot typically aim for, for a client? Yeah. So we have a bunch of folks. I'd say our, a lot of our early customers and clients were and are technology startups of various kinds, whether it's two people in a garage just getting started or a company that has, you know, 300, 500 employees and a full-time finance team. Like tech startups are really where we got our start and we're just a perfect slam dunk fit for them. We also have a lot of e-commerce companies. We have a lot of consultancies. We have, it's, we have a quite diverse and interesting mix of businesses that we serve. I would say the, the theme that is present in all of them is that they're all quite tech forward or quite modern businesses. Like today, if you have a stack of paper receipts and you handle a lot of cash and there are no electronic systems, pilot is not a very good fit for you. But if you're all in kind of modern electronic workflows, that's really our sweet spot. Okay. Now where, where do you see pilot? Where, what's the goal? So the goal ultimately kind of, as as we sort of said earlier in this conversation, like there's all of this stuff you have to do to have your business operate that is not the area of expertise of the business owner. And a big piece of that is the accounting and the tax and the finances. But there's also like legal and HR and IT and business insurance and small business lending and all this stuff, all this stuff that is important. It's important to get right, but it is not your area of expertise. I want Pilot to be the trusted partner that just takes care of all that stuff for you. And I think a a good analogy, and it's a little bit technical is like, if you look at something like Amazon web services, like when we first started our first company in 2009, 2008, 2009, the status quo at the time is if you needed a server somewhere, like you went to a data center and you like put the server there and sometimes the hard drive died and you had to replace it. And it was a huge pain. And then Amazon came along and said, you know what, if we run your technical infra for you, we'll do a better job of it and it will be more scalable and you'll get magic that you can't get anywhere else. And over time, Amazon with Amazon Web Services did more and more and more, which meant that your business didn't have to hire a whole engineering team dedicated to running and maintaining that infrastructure. And they did a better job than you would have had you done it anyway. I want to do that same thing, but not for your technical infrastructure, but for your company's infrastructure. In other words, your back office. So all this stuff that's important, it's really critical. You want an expert doing it. If we can do it all for you under one roof and you can focus on the unique reason you started the business in the first place, I think it's really, really powerful. And so how do you plan to, do you plan to kind of grow by acquisitions or bring in just, because you mentioned there are areas of expertise, legal, you know, that you're still unfamiliar with. How does Pilot plan to grow into those areas that they may be unfamiliar with? You know, it's a it's an interesting question, and and I think this is really like the twenty year plan for the company. I think we have plenty. We have our work cut out for us, <laughs> really, just on the kind of like accounting and finance yeah, stuff certainly. that we do really well today. Um, so there's there's an interesting kind of strategy question of well, at what point does it make sense to pursue additional things beyond your first thing? And I think there's so much opportunity in what we're doing today that I think it probably does not make sense to invest a ton in, you know, products two through five. We should be laser focused on the thing we do well today that we know customers want that we have, you know, that we've really kind of built some muscle around speaking around. You know, and I think that's an important lesson for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially, you know, coming from you who've scaled multiple businesses and, and actually sold them is to also understand um, there's a time and a place to scale. Uh, and you can't do it all at once, you know, Rome, you can't absolutely not, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day kind of thing. Focus is just like such a key element, I think for your company being successful. 
Now, what advice, what additional advice do you have for these young entrepreneurs, you know, un- other entrepreneurs, inspiring entrepreneurs, business owners, innovators? What advice would you have for them? Uh, we talked about this a little bit already, but I'd say you just have to stay really, really close to your customers, which are your customers are the ones that are going to hold you accountable. And if you listen to them, I generally find that it puts you on the right track because it, it, Customer demand is like the one thing you can't really fake or fool yourself with. And so I think the closer you are to the customer, the more viscerally you understand who they are, what they care about, why they buy, what you do well, what you do poorly. Like that's such a key insight in helping your business be successful. And I think it is very dangerous to ignore it. You're really flying blind if you, if you're not close to it. With that said, what, what, kind of tactics did your team use to really, you, you mentioned, um, you know, you, you mentioned some of the things, but what are some of the other tactics you used to kind of understand your customer? Well, so actually in the early days we did, in addition to like talking to the customers to get them on board, we actually like did all their bookkeeping ourselves. So we were, we were extremely in the weeds on it. We were very, very hands-on with the customer because we wanted to understand deeply what did they care about? Like what are the problems they have? How do we make sure that what we're doing really resonates with them? So I, I'd say stay as close as you can possibly stay closer than you think you need to. I like it. I like it. Wasim, thank you so much again for joining the Shades of Entrepreneurship. I really do appreciate it. Now, before you go, how did the folks, how do the listeners, how do they find your business? Where can they get in contact with you if they're interested in learning more about Pilot? Where do they find you? Sure. So you can find me personally. I have a Substack at wasim.substack.com or I'm Wasim on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Uh, and then for Pilot, you can find us at pilot.com slash shades. And in fact, if you sign up there, you can get 20% off your first six months with Pilot. So pilot.com slash shades. We've got a special promo, uh, Gabriel, for our listeners of, listeners of the pod. Which nice. We're excited to kind of debut. Yep. Nice. And I will make sure that will be on the folks. Uh, they'll be on the newsletter as well. So please subscribe to the newsletter uh, for the more information. Again, Wasim, thank you so much for joining us. For those listening at home, please follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And subscribe to the newsletter. And have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com. Come on.